Okay, um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Sam James. He's one of the leading experts in earthworm ecology and diversity. And he's going to give us an overview of the earthworms of the world and tell us about some of his amazing uh, travels and adventures discovering new earthworms uh, from all over the world. So Sam, over to you. All right, so welcome everyone. I'm glad to be here. It's, it's going to be quick. I have to leave my abode around uh, an hour and a half from now. Uh, so anyway, uh, you'll see here is a picture of a big worm, not that big actually. This is from Brazil. And you'll see a bunch of logos and whatnot. That's just to remind you all and me that uh, this cost a bunch of money. The National Science Foundation of the United States, the Fulbright uh, Commission for work in Brazil and Argentina, uh, Embrapa Florestas and CNPq. These are Brazilian institutions that supported a, quite a lot of, of work with myself and collaborators in Brazil. And um, now straight on. So what am I going to do? I'm going to briefly go over a little bit of the general ecology of earthworms, then more on the classification, diversity, and where they are found of earthworms, biogeography, and then briefly touch on the uh, role of humans in redistribution of earthworms around the world. And uh, we all know that Katalin Slavesh will be doing more on that. But I'll also I'll finish up with just a, a quick note on where earthworms and humans have had a, uh, a kind of mutually beneficial relationship in the uh, parts of the Amazon basin. Okay, so earthworms, we all kind of probably know that, yeah, generally very beneficial organisms and, and key portions of their ecosystems. But in this remarkable, uh, even to me, after all these years, that earthworms are the biggest single biomass component from animals in almost every ecosystem in which they occur. So that means more than the mammals, more than the birds combined, and pretty much more than anything else with the possible exception of uh, nematodes, which, which we can't even see. Anyway, they're all over wherever there's enough water to grow trees and shrubs, uh, generally you can find earthworms there. The only continent that doesn't have them is Antarctica, and that's for obvious reasons. Okay, and they have a great diversity of, of effects on soils having to do with uh, aeration, drainage, macro aggregate formation, the structure of the soil. All of the things that live in the soil as well are beneficiaries of the physical structuring effects that earthworms have. So we call them engineers, uh, or ecosystem engineers at the soil level. So these are all things that are below ground that we don't really see, but as you'll find out more, there are also some rather large scale effects. This is a left is an aerial photo of this region of Colombia and right is a closer view. And you'll hear more about these later, but just wanted to say these are created by earthworms. In another place in South America, the um, coastal plains of the state of Amapá, Brazil, we found these big heaps. The, you know, they're the size of a, some cases of almost like a, a small vehicle, like a mini or a, an old Volkswagen. And the local name for them is Murunduns, and they are created by earthworms. We were there in a dry season, no water, but during the rainy season, those are little islands with earthworms living on them. Okay, on to the next. Okay, about their ecological function. So this is the functional diversity of earthworms. Now you don't really need to care too much about these technical terms, anisic, endogeic, and so forth, but this just, indicates how you can find earthworms functioning in uh, a different species doing very different things. Some that live 
in organic matter accumulations on the soil surface or rotten logs. In tropical places, they may be up in trees, in uh, epiphytic plants or accumulations of organic matter. And this is one of the things I found in many places in the New World tropics, in Asia, in Africa. They're living above ground in organic matter accumulations. So the leaf axles of uh, palm trees, for example, or specifically in the New World, bromeliads form uh, tanks that collect water and organic matter from above. And these are little micro ecosystems. So those are epigeic uh, and more commonly in uh, higher latitudes, they are living in forest floor soils at, at the surface and under dead logs or under the bark of fallen trees. Then anasics are typically large bodied and live in a deep burrow, but they exit to feed at the surface. And some of them obtain rather large sizes. The a very common earthworm in North America, but is from Europe, we call it the night crawler in, the, in North America. It's, I, here it's called lobworm in, in Britain. And I'm sure it has other names in other places. It's anisic and it does this thing of coming out at night, feeding on decomposed leaves uh, and then retreating to its burrow during the day. Then there are worms that live in the soil, and there's a range of types of those where some are living closer to the surface on more freshly uh, decaying organic material, and others live deeper in, uh, and some are uh, found often quite far down in the soil, not super far, but down where the organic matter quality is uh, quite different generally lower, more resistant, harder to digest. And so this combination of all of these different activities has the effect of mixing soils vertically, uh, dis redistributing organic matter and soil mineral components from upper to lower. That middle worm in there, I think you can probably see my cursor, that was a uh, living really close to the surface, a, a dark blue worm from the eastern mountains of Jamaica. Next shot, this is what happens when you have lots of Lumbricus terrestris, nightcrawler, lobworm, living in, in the back garden. This is the last leaf of the previous autumn has been pulled down into a burrow by one of those guys, and it's going to be chewing on it <clears throat> in the dark as that leaf decomposes. These worms also create little heaps of, of castings, their, their fecal material and the remains of those leaves. And then other earthworms and many other organisms come and feed on those. So now on to the more of the biological diversity. We've had functional diversity uh, and now the sort of what we call the, the biodiversity of earthworms are so I was part of a big project called the uh, a Worm Net 2, the Assembling the Tree of Life of Annelida. And we did a big project. Here's some of my collaborators named below. Uh, Andy Anderson, Krister Erzios from Sweden, myself, Ronwin Williams, uh, Kevin Horn, uh, Raquel Santos, and uh, Ken Halanich. All of them are specialists in different sectors of the uh, annelid phylum, some of them on the polychaete worms of, of marine and in some cases even fresh waters, uh, and others on leeches up, up there at the top right, and then top left and bottom right, some of the non-earthworm uh, oligochaete or oligochaetes or clitolata. So clitolata, what is that? That is a big section of the segmented worm phylum, the annelids. And it means that they have this thing called a clitellum, which you can see here on this worm is a band around the front end. This is a, a reproductive structure used in creating the, the egg capsule or cocoon. So uh, there's a whole the grand diversity of these things in uh, fresh waters, marine, and soils 
all over the place. But the crassy clitellata, the ones that have a thick clitellum, those are earthworms. So we sampled all of the earthworms we could find, and this meant me going all over the world, finding them in, in pretty much every continent with the help of colleagues. And we got this. Uh, and then there've been other things so, since this, but this is the most important thing. Now, never mind what, what all this gobbledygook up here, phylo base, cat, GTR, tree, et cetera. This is an outline of the evolutionary history of earthworms. And we find that there are, there's a, a very deep split, two major groups in the base of each group is indicated with this little green and yellow starburst thing. One of them is uh, composed of a worm from Madagascar, Kynotus, and then two from North America. Really interesting. They were uh, very far apart from each other geographically. And this is one of the oldest, deepest divisions within the earthworm realm. And that has within it a North Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere split. So Madagascar on the South and Sparganophilus and Comericiona in the North. And then we have the rest of them, the other starburst here, which includes the Palearctic, that is and Nearctic um, Lumbricity, mainly that's this big group in blue, that's the North. And then the South is everything else um, African, South American, Australian, and so forth, uh, New Zealand. So we thought, oh, that's interesting. So that's a, a very ancient diversion and led us to the question of just how old are they? And so we focused on two older divisions within this tree. And we used a couple of different sets of data, but we basically got somewhere around 204 million years ago uh, to two, so roughly 200, 170 to 200 million years ago is when these, these old divisions within earthworms occurred. So <clears throat> they've been around a long time. And we asked, are these consistent with some of the old events of Earth's history, such as the breakup of Pangaea? which we knew took place roughly 200 million years ago. So here it is, what our world looked like, sort of, uh, roughly 190 million years ago, about the time of that divergence that we see in earthworms. And then after, a, oh, another 50, 60 million years ago, there's now a, an ocean barrier between lots of sections that were all formerly joined together. So that seems to be consistent with, and as this big yellow arrow shows you that, that major, the opening of the Atlantic and that North America and Eurasia are still joined in the North. And that turns out to be important because there is a family, we'll get to it next, uh, that occurs on both sides of that break as well as other things with uh, strong relationships. So now I'm going to move on into the, uh, an overview of the, of the diversity of the earthworms that we found. So you, you just heard me talk about Sparganophility in North America and Comerichiona and the Kynotidae, a family from Madagascar. And these three made up that deep split. Absent from that analysis is another one that we didn't have data for, but we know from another project that this is a, a Japanese species of earthworm. It's the only member of its family, lives in an area around Lake Biwa in Japan and is semi-aquatic. It is closely related to the Kynotidae of Madagascar. So these are the Sparganophility pictured here on the right, this is a North American endemic that's semi-aquatic. Comerichiona is only one species and it lives in the Eastern uh, forests of the 
USA in the Appalachian Mountain region. Not common, rather difficult to find. Uh, the Kynodidae are all over Madagascar and they're, they're, they range in size from ordinary to giant. And then Bioadrility just, it lives in the lake bottom and in <laughs> rice paddy margins in the nearby area. Um, so when you have semi-aquatic earthworms, you start seeing things like this on the right. This is at the water's edge, lots of casting material. They, they live in the saturated sediment and then they defecate on the surface. So you see this, this stuff and you think, ah, oh, that's where I'll dig. And so you go. All right, um, this on the bottom is a member of the Kynotidae, not a particularly remarkable looking earthworm, looks like many, many others. But to me, remarkable because there's the only place in the world you'll ever see it is in Madagascar. And they're all over. Now, um, in that Northern Hemisphere group, there are four main families. Two of them are shown here. Cryodrility and Lutodrility. Cryodrillus lacuum is European. You can find it in Latvia, you can find it in Portugal, and probably in most places in between. And it is semi aquatic, lives at the margins of bodies of water or even at the bottom. So it becomes a kind of uh, a benthic, uh, bottom dwelling uh, organism. And it tends to be a little bit greenish. Um, and like many of the other semi-aquatics, it has a square tail end. And Ludodrillus multivesiculatus is a remarkable earthworm. It's this dark gray, greenish color, also semi-aquatic. And you can see this kind of squarish uh, feature here, the corners where the CTR are on this worm on the left. Ludodrillus only lives in fine textured mud near rivers in the extreme eastern end, the southeastern bit of the state of Louisiana near the Gulf Coast uh, along the Pearl River drainage. And we have looked in various places nearby and haven't found it yet. There's a rumor that it might occur in, farther west in Louisiana in the deltas of the Mississippi. Anyway, it is about 30 to 40 centimeters long at adulthood and uh, rather speedy, so it takes a little bit of work to get it. So these are sort of more ancestral, so to say, to another group of earthworms that is very common in Europe, and that is the Hormogastridae. Now, here's Hormogaster gallica, nice, fat worm, and you can see a one euro coin in there for scale. This is collected in, uh, that was below a, a farm terrace wall in, the, in Spain, not far from the French border. And bottom right, Hemigastrodilus monicae lives in the region of Montpellier in southern France. And Ilus golex lactiospumosus, which is one of the strangest of small earthworms I have found. It, it's almost, it's so delicate. It's almost like a little, like a, a thin membranous bag uh, with segments barely visible inside and a whitish fluid. And that's why it's called lactiospumosus because it's sort of like milky. Anyway, these are <clears throat> quite common. Uh, they were not so well known, but uh, Danny, who's coming up next, has found loads of these things throughout the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, and uh, islands um, like uh, Corsica and so forth in the Mediterranean. Now, these those are <clears throat> a kind of a, a cousin family, a, a sister family to the Lumbricidae which are the most common earthworms for most people living in cooler climate to temperate zones. So Britain is permeated by them, as is the European continent and bits of North America. The eastern and central parts of North America have one, uh, two genera, 
of this family. But otherwise, uh, it's, it's really predominantly a Euro Eurasian uh, family with members found from the Iberian Peninsula all the way across and into Central Asia. So top left, Heliella, this was found, this is in Turkey, in the Kurdish uh, ethnic region of Turkey. Octodrillus, I obtained this in Romania. Procellodrillus and Scarathica there on the bottom are uh, French specimens that I collected. And again, the same one euro coin. Scarathicas tend to be very large. Uh, very large, meaning from lobworm size up to a meter long. And there are octodrilluses in Romania that are also a meter. So giant worms, although we think of these as you know sort of exotic things that occur in faraway places like Australia, you can find them in Europe as well. Uh, in North America, we have this genus called Bimastos, that is a epigeic forest dweller for the most part, but there's another one that is a deep endogeic dwelling species in our central uh, North American grasslands, they are, are, which are native prairie grass, as we call them. Okay, so that's the lumbricity. And now moving along to South Africa. My colleagues, uh, Kenbeka there in the middle and Danuta Plisko and Pumaleni. They were, we were on a little collecting trip in the Western Cape region <laughs> together. And Kenbeka is now uh, on her own as a uh, professor of biology in uh, KwaZulu-Natal and Danuta Plisko is lesser 90 odd years old and tottering around still in the streets of Warsaw. She had moved to South Africa, it's a long story, but then upon retirement, uh, well into her 80s, she decided to go back to her native Poland. So microketidae, this is a uniquely South African family. And then the work that Danuta and Tembeka have done suggests that it may be two or three families, actually, the Kazimierzidae and the Tritogenidae. So uh, a Kazimierzidae representative is in the bottom on that reddish iron-stained sand, and the others are microketids. I didn't have a photo of anything from the Tritogenidae, but the Tritogenidae are odd. They're, they're short and stubby little fellows. They're, um, you know, maybe 10 centimeters long and uh, quite a lot thicker for their body length than most earthworms are. And again, the microketides span the full range of sizes and colors. There are two meter long microketidae living in uh, various types of grassland habitats in South Africa. Now, I'm sort of working my way up the branches of the evolutionary history of earthworms as I do this. And there's this bunch called the Almidae, and they're all semi-aquatic. They live on several continents. So we find them in South America. Um, maybe they're a different group there, but we're not really sure yet. The uh, Alma was named for the, uh, the genus Alma is found in Africa, uh, Alma nilotica in the Nile Basin, but they also occur in Gabon and the you know West Africa and in Kenya. So <clears throat> they they tend to be long, dark green and living in the saturated muds on the uh, swamps and the edges of bodies of water. Um, so the they all have the same habit. So in South America, there's a, a big one that we found along rice field margins in Southern Brazil, in Southeast Asia, Thailand, which is where these photos were taken. We have small, smaller earthworms of, of this group living in stream margins and stream bottoms. And so these are the, what's called Glyphidrillus, uh, that's a different genus. And South Asia, of course, you know, India also has them. 
So again, semi-aquatic as a lifestyle seems to just pop up. You know, uh, it appears to be descended from ancestors that were not semi-aquatic, but were ordinary terrestrial. So this is something that earthworms do. They go back and forth between land and almost water. Okay, so one of the descendants of an almady type ancestor appears to be one of these. This is uh, the, the family Rhinodrilidae, and here is a gigantic one from Ecuador. Now, perspective is always a magnifier of earthworms, hands, faces, and so forth, as we all know from getting too close to that selfie. But if you just use the man's fingers and the stick for scale, you can see that this is a, a really, really large earthworm. This one, I unfortunately was not present at the discovering. This one lives in a volcano in Ecuador in a very wet forest. And uh, this is the, uh, to the right is the underside uh, of another giant earthworm of the Rhinodrility, this one from Brazil. And bottom, we'll see the hands of uh, uh, Francian Gamiet on the island of Guadalupe, oddly, where there is another rather large specimen collected at the highest elevation of that island. This family occurs throughout South America and somewhat into uh, Central America. So Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Southern Mexico. There's a very prominent member of this family uh, geographically, and this is Pontoscolex corathurus. It's probably the most common earthworm in the world, uh, given that it is present in just about every tropical region so far that anybody has looked. If you see a lot of blank spots on that map, it's because we just don't have data in the, like for example, the tropical uh, belt of, of Africa but I'm almost certain it will be found there. It may not be in Chile, it might, it's probably in Bolivia, but no one has looked. And it's on all of the Caribbean islands that I have visited, which is most of them. So there should be also lots of little red dots there in this, in this region. So it is all over the place, but it originated in the north eastern bit of Brazil, so up here near the mouth of the Amazon and into the Guianas. And it is just everywhere and does almost everything. Another family that's unique to, to the Neotropics in South America and somewhat in Central America with some outliers in the uh, Antilles, the small islands, is the Glossoscolicity. And we keep finding more and more of these in Brazil and a huge range of sizes from delicate slender little ones to you know meter long you know 2 centimeter diameter monsters and uh, very characteristic of southern and southeastern brazil uh, but with other members of their family uh, scattered in amongst the rhinodrility throughout the rest of uh, south america except the andean uh, or the western coast, but then you can find them in Colombia, you can find them in Peru, you can find them in Venezuela, for example. So very diverse group. Here's another one. Um, this is from southern Brazil, the state of Rio Grande do Sul. And now over to Africa, which has a unique family, the Eudrilidae. There's a famous one that's used in vermicomposting in tropical areas. These are just sort of ones you typically, you know, you would find more typically in soils. Hyperiodrillus africanus is a little bit more widely spread than Africa. It's gotten around. I have found it in Brazil. I have found it in, it's been found in many locations in West Africa. Uh, Polyteroitus is in Kenya. It's uh, a very abundant genus there. These have a, the only earthworms known to have internal fertilization. So that's an oddity, uh, a very diverse family. And again, the full range of functional and a functional diversity and a very highly diverse uh, biologically as well. 
probably descended from something like a eudrility is a family called the Achnerodrility. These occur in Africa and generally throughout the Southern Hemisphere, not though in the Australia, New Zealand region. So South America, uh, Madagascar, Africa, India, Dominican Republic, um, very diverse. We're just discovering how diverse in Brazil. Uh, huge numbers of new species and new genera turning up in places where no one had ever looked. Uh, and quite a lot of the common ones are semi-aquatic. So we'll find them in wetlands and stream margins and places like that. And they are where certain uh, reproductive structures first appear. So like this, this odd little area here, this is the male genital field of this earthworm. There's something similar to that appears then in, in others that are uh, in a family, a super family called the Megascolicoidea. And this is one of the families within that called the Acanthodrility. Originally, the first one's found in New Caledonia, but uh, the photos here are two from New Zealand, uh, top right, bottom left, Neodrillus and Hoplochitina. New Zealand has a huge diversity of these things. It's, we know of a couple hundred, but there's probably more like 800 of them. <clears throat> Just they're very, very localized in distribution, which is true of earthworms generally. Bottom right is from the state of Georgia up in the forest. This is a, our native genus Diplocardia, uh, from, which is found in the southeastern and central United States and even has some members in California and northern Mexico. So, the, but very diverse within Australia, New Zealand, and um, Southern South Africa, Southern South America. So uh, Argentina and Chile, and there are members uh, of it in the Indian subcontinent as well. And then a related, closely related family is the Benhanidae. Very diverse in Africa, the, the wet part of Africa, the sort of sub-Saharan, but north of the um, Namib desert region, you'll find this family, Benhanidae, extremely diverse all the way across into East Africa, very many of them there. These are things that I came up with. <clears throat> One of them, Dicogaster caribensis, is a bromeliad dweller from the island of Guadeloupe. Uh, top right is a dicogaster with a nice little design of its male genital field. This is from Fiji, out in the Pacific, a real biogeographical puzzle. And then there's one or two that have turned up in Brazil. This little one here, kind of greenish, I found in the decaying remains of a, a the base of a bromeliad up in a tree. They are all closely related to this other family, the Megascolicity. And this is the source of some worms that you'll be hearing about later as they have invaded uh, North America. And there's some oddities here as well. Uh, first, on the left, a semi-aquatic but marine dwelling earthworm. This is Pontodrillus littoralis. There are many different versions of Pontodrillus, different species, different parts of the world. This is the most commonly found one, or, or almost everything will be identified as Pontodrillus littoralis until you get into the details. These live on um, seashores, but in warm and tropical areas and where there's not too much wave action. So this one was uh, from a a gently uh, waves lapping on the beach kind of place in Thailand. And then bottom left, a stripy member of the megascolicity from of called Ferretima, and there's a leech photobombing it at the base. And then top right is the famous fried egg worm, Archiferetima middletoni. This lives on the forest floor in a particular region of the uh, north island of the Philippines, Luzon, in the mountains. Its young live as arboreal earthworms, but the adults, you just find them by crawl, walking around on the forest floor and, uh, and picking them up. 
And last but not least, this is uh, Scott Bartlum from New Zealand Land Care Service and a, uh, a lot, rather large amount of soil excavated behind him and a rather large Spenceriella uh, that he dug up. Okay, so what do we learn from earthworms? Lots of different things. They seem to be uh, rather slow about getting from place to place. So they're highly localized and they don't cross oceans very well. So we can use them as, as kind of uh, geographical indicators of past patterns of the arrangement of the bits of land on the earth. Uh, other things like when uh, people in Taiwan have discovered stream capture events, you know, erosion, uh, rivers coming and going, mountain ranges coming uh, and so forth. And then humans, uh, we started moving earthworms around. And so we've even thought about tracking the movements of peoples in the South Pacific using the kinds of earthworms that inadvertently came along with them. So there's a group of earthworms we found in the Philippines, super diverse there, very, very sparse diversity elsewhere, but they are scattered all throughout the South Pacific. And we suspect that the Polynesian migrations had something to do with that. Okay, invasive species of earthworms. Now, much of Northern Europe has only the same set of earthworms as we have in much of Northern North America. The glaciated regions tend to have recent arrivals. And in the case of North America, that is largely the lumbricity from Europe, but also some from Asia. So they do things. Um, lots of stuff happens when they show up uh, in areas where they, there haven't been earthworms before. But I won't talk too much about that. Uh, it's a complicated problem, not only because of what they're doing and the fact that it's almost impossible to get rid of them, but because there's a lot of hidden diversity within them that we can't really see except by genetic means. But we do know that there's a fairly uh, predictable outcome depending upon the amount of disturbance and the intensity of the disturbance and how, you know, sort of how frequent it is. So the, where we have had native earthworms uh, and the intensities of say, you know, human or other disturbances are low and, uh, and the frequency is low, the native species tend to remain in place. Anywhere higher frequency or higher intensity, such as deforestation, we tend to see the domination by exotic species. So in tropical areas, this would be Pontoscolex corythrurus. Uh, extensive in areas that have been deforested and even if they've been replanted, that's what we typically see. All right, so now, now that I just mentioned Pontoscolex again, I promised you something on the Amazon dark earths. So Amazon dark earths are created by human activity. This is agricultural activity of uh, chucking out of household trash and waste and charcoal and so forth. Uh, just whatever refuse you can imagine produced by a village of humans living on a terrace above the river, that's what goes into Amazon dark earths. And we suspect, and the archaeologists agree, that humans may have moved some earth with them as they shifted. So this is a based on a kind of uh, shifting cultivation where earth or, or people cultivate an area and then they up sticks and move to another spot and cultivate there. So they'll clear, burn, and cultivate. And they will do this back and forth. They may return to an old site some years later. So there are archeological uh, bits of evidence that these villages tended to be formed in rings and you can see the evidence of, of semi-overlapping circles as they, they set up a village they didn't accept in exactly the same spot. So these, this over the passage of time, uh, these, this activity builds 
layers of soil that are starkly different from the original type of soil. So you can see in this main photo, at the bottom is this kind of light brown. At the top, it's a very dark gray. This is in a region where the ordinary soil would be more like what's here at the bottom and very infertile and not that much good for agriculture. But the Amazon dark earths have an extraordinarily high nutrient level for their area and a pretty good by global standards nutrient concentrations. Here are some other photos of Amazon dark earth. It is black. It's as black as any great of uh, soil found in uh, the central USA or the steppes of Ukraine and other places famous for high quality soil. And the other thing you see in these soils is when we were digging them up in uh, the Southern Amazon basin is pottery fragments. Bottom photo, those are pottery fragments, not rocks. This is an archeologically dug pit and they are interested in layer by layer and all of these bits sticking out of the sides are pottery fragments. So this is Amazon dark earths oh, almost a meter deep. So it really builds up. And there's pretty good evidence that people were moving it around. In one of these pits, there, the cultural artifacts were older on the top of the pit than they were at the bottom, which means that they moved something older from somewhere else and dumped it on top of the, of the younger material. We've had a, a lot of work done on this and we'll see more in the future, I hope. Okay, that's pretty much it for me, and I hope you've enjoyed this. Here's a, a final note on earthworm reproduction. That's an earthworm egg casing or a cocoon, and the little yellow shadow is a baby worm. Okay, I'll stop the share.